welcome to the Turn by Turn podcast. When I was researching developers to talk to, I stumbled upon a game that united Oregon Trail and TRPG battle mechanics. I knew immediately that I had to speak with its creator. We hope you enjoy our conversation. Talking with Brian, who is the creator of Dunnigan's Trail. Brian, how are you doing today? Good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. So Dunnigan's Trail is a turn-based game, which is a roguelite. Um, so what is a roguelite? What is that? <laughs> well, I think roguelite, I think uh, it's like you want to make a roguelike, but you didn't quite meet all the criteria. And so you just stuck light on the end and said, because uh, my understanding is that there's a pretty uh, specific definition for roguelikes. And so if it's like a more casual version, that's where roguelite comes up. And that, uh, if you're not familiar, is based on the game Rogue as well. I, I, mean, if, I mean, maybe that can be inferred. but <laughs> So it means uh, most sort of like different every time, right? Right, yeah. It's supposed to be about replayability. There's usually procedural generation. Um, so those kinds of things are like the focus of mine. And, you know, once you die, the game is over and you have to restart. So that, that I would say those are like the, the main elements that I have there. That are kind of like the roguelite elements. So you're Brian. Do you, uh, do you want to tell us a little about yourself? Sure. Uh, I don't know if you want my whole backstory necessarily. Um, the developer and creator for Dunnigan's Trail. Um, I have a background as a .NET developer working on business software. I did that for the past few years. Up until this past February, I actually ended up going full-time indie because I had the opportunity to and I was kind of burnt out from coding for uh, you know some of these companies. So and before that, I was... Um, I was in the Navy for about five years as um, a spy radar technician. So that that's pretty much wow. the extent of my <laughs> of what I've been doing since I graduated in high school, I guess. That sounds like more than most of us. <laughs> yeah, it's been it's been an interesting ride. <laughs> so you're working full time on Dunnigan's Trail right now? That's um, great. I, I started working on it part time, like before work. About I was back in December, and I actually originally I made a small prototype for school when I was graduating um, about four years ago. I was going to school for computer science, um, but that was just like a, a project thing. So I got the prototype done in March and decided to uh, pull the trigger on this and actually release a game. Yeah, is, so is this the first game that you've made? This is my uh, the first game I plan on releasing. I had another one I worked on for a couple years before this. That was, um, that was supposed to be a straight-up roguelike. Uh, it was called Delivered, and the whole premise behind that one was uh, it was like far future, post-apocalyptic, and um, you were a uh, deliverer, basically like this this holy role that gets passed down in your family, and you you deliver pizza to like other families, um, like in these settlements. And the uh, I guess the unique thing about that game was when you died, the pizza order didn't go away. You came back as a descendant, and history would kind of hop, hop ahead like twenty years or so, and so like. It might take you a few centuries to deliver this pizza, and it was a whole like holy thing. It was just supposed to be something stupid, but it just never took off. That sounds awesome, though. <laughs> like I, I really want to play that. I, I'm hoping that once I get done with this game and things kind of like peter out, and um, I, I kind of want to go back and and finish that one because I, I've I've wanted to finish it for a while, but it was my first game, and I didn't know what I was doing. You know, you should though, because that's a fantastic idea. It really sounds like what it sounds like. <laughs> I can send you guys some um, some screenshots and stuff like that and what's not. I think I have some stuff left over if you want to see what it was looking oh, like yeah. at the time. Absolutely. Yeah. I want to play it. <laughs> I'm wildly <laughs> curious now. <laughs> Speaking of uh, playing, though, we should we should talk about what is Dunnigan's Trail like for for people listening. Uh, what what is kind of the gameplay? So Dunnigan's Trail is a it's a choose your own adventure um, tactical turn based RPG. So there's two main modes of the game. Most of, uh, I would say like part of the time you're spending on the trail making decisions like you would in Oregon Trail, and then there are some combat encounters um, throughout that time. So basically, the story like the background of it is that you're playing as one of those exotic. Uh, exact traders you see in RPGs that are kind of like, they're always dressed up like in purple or something, have like a top hat and they sell all the exotic stuff. Um, You're in a peaceful land, so your business is dried up. And so basically you're like, well, I just need to like pack up and go towards the most evil place possible in order to make some money here because that's where people are buying my equipment. Uh, Mm. So you hire some mercenaries and you go on the road and I think you're supposed to make, it's 15 days so, so are you still traveling to Oregon with that description? 
Yeah. <laughs> it seems like it these days, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> so where, where are you headed? Where's the destination? That one, uh, so that's one of those things. There's, uh, it's just like a name and uh, that I generate every time. Um, but basically, mm. I would just imagine Mordor in your head, you know. Ah. So, so not Mordor. You know, you, you basically mm -hmm. get to this fiery, inhosp inhospitable land, and that's where you have to end up. So I'm curious how the roguelite functions with this. Like, so if you, I guess regular Oregon Trail, if you die, that's it. It's not mm -hmm. a real forgiving game, but uh, does yours have like when you die? Is there like stats that are carried over, or items, or anything to help you on your next journey? You know, I haven't thought about the progression part of it that much, hmm. but that's a good idea. Yeah, actually, that's something I should I should think about because um, what the only thing I've been really thinking about in those terms is having different merchants that you would unlock mm, and you, okay. you could play as different ones and they would have different pros and cons. But I haven't flushed that out yet. I've just used a default merchant so far, but that's a good idea. Um, All right, I, I got one more to throw your way. Then you pass by like your broken down wagon the next time you play. Like maybe it's been a couple oh, yeah. generations and there's a broken wagon on the side of the road where some yeah. failed adventurers died. That's a good idea. Yeah. So if you keep like the same, in fact, it would be kind of cool if you, if you kept the same kind of trail, like um, it might be a change just slightly, but you run into the same kinds of people and everything like that. So there's some kind of permanence. Because it could be that like the broken down cart has the items that you had from your last playthrough. And maybe, um, maybe some of them. I, I would imagine the Jawas have picked over a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Is this canonically in the Star Wars universe? <laughs> well, we talked Lord of the Rings, so I just figured. So the fighting style seems a lot like Shining Force or Fire Emblem. Do you like those games? Or are those? I've never played them. Um, nice. I've always wanted to play Fire Emblem. Awesome. Um, <laughs> but the combat is based off of Battle Brothers. I don't know if you guys have played that. Mm -mm. Um, no? I think, have you guys played Mountain Blade? Have you heard of that? Uh, I've heard of it. So it's, Battle Brothers to Sorry. me was sort of like mountain blade but then they're like wait, let's stick turn-based combat on this and it's it's pretty brutal and unforgiving it's the same kind of situation where you're traveling around with these mercenaries and um and, and fighting like uh you know other other war bands and like creatures and things like that but i really liked how the combat played out so um i adopted a lot of the kind of the feel and look of how they set those up because it seemed pretty clear but not too over encumbering for people like with too much you know info on the screen and everything mm -hmm. It looks pretty clean and nice. Um, I'm just really surprised because it looks so much like Shining Force. Really? <laughs> yeah. <it> really, really <laughs> I need to look at the, what is this Shining Force? Let me see. It really does. It's the game we harp on a lot <laughs> that we both love. <laughs> okay. Yeah, how we how we literally met? Yes. Oh wow. Being the two fans of that game. <laughs> oh, I see what you mean. With like the different character models and stuff. So yeah. What does so you said your your goal is to kind of make it in like 15 days? So can you play through like those 15 days in like a couple of hours or? Yeah, I would say it's a pretty short run. The demo is going to be set up for five days. I guess I'm going to have to play test this some more to get a better idea of what the of what the pacing is going to be like because i would say because since i you know when i'm blowing through it testing things it's going to go a lot faster for me because i already know what's going on i would say that i can get through five days in probably like 15 or 20 minutes depending on how the fights go i would say like a standard run through is probably like an hour and a half maybe an hour or something like that i, I think that sounds reasonable for an oregon trail style tactical game especially something where it's you, you end up dying anyway at some point a lot and you don't want to like pour three or four hours I mean, maybe you do I could probably make a longer version for that, but the yeah. hardcore run. <laughs> right. Exactly. You have to do 25 days or something crazy. And also just having different game modes. So I guess, of course, I'm, I'd probably put like a hard mode and um, there's, um, you know, maybe some modifiers and things like that. I haven't quite, in, quite gotten around to like thinking about that sort of thing until I got the core game done. So do like the mercenaries that you hire, are they like specific characters or are they more like units? So would it be like Knight or would it be like Knight Calvin? It's more like Knight Calvin. So a lot of these guys, they have their their uh, class. So there's like um, spearmen, you have crossbowmen, um, there might be a knight, gladiators, things like that. And, but they all have um, they all have names that are generated at runtime. And um, I want to give them like some really small backgrounds or like traits or something like that. Maybe something like you'd see in Rim World or um, uh, like Death Row the Canned or something like that to give them a little bit of personality. You know, I'm familiar with that one. Which one, uh, Death Road? Yeah, yeah. That that was. Uh, I I based the travel and like the choose your own adventure portion like very heavily on Death Road because I just love how it flows and the tone of it and everything like that. 
do you have like an expected release date that you're hoping for or is it still sort of up in the air i know that's kind of an unfair question to ask um, I've been shooting. I've been shooting for uh, quarter one right now. I'm, I'm I'm hoping for February, but you know how these things go. It's like you think it's going to take like a month, and then it's, <laughs> then it's like two months later you haven't even gotten half done what you wanted. So, um, which I guess just goes for all software. But yeah, quarter one I would say is almost a certainty, even if it gets pushed back to March. But I definitely don't want to release you know around Christmas time. There's I would just be drowned out of all the AAA stuff. Very potentially. Um, how's the soundtrack going? <laughs> Pretty good, actually. I um, I ran. I met someone on Twitter, and she uh, she showed me some of her stuff, and I ended up really liking it. I, I went for like a 16-bit style to kind of match the graphics a little bit, and so I think I have most of the the soundtrack that I want right now. I might need a few a uh, few other ones here and there, but um, I'm pretty happy with what I've got right now. It sounds like that's going good. Yeah. Yeah, one less thing to worry about, I hope. Do you do all the character designs and stuff, or do you have like some other people that you're working with for this one? The sprites I bought off HIO. Yes, I bought I bought those assets. Uh, the same thing of like the overworld and the UI too. Like he had everything set up, so I took those and modified them, um, recolored them for the palette that I wanted, and then mm-hmm. um, and I put them in the game. And there's been a few other things like the backgrounds. Um, some of those I. It's like I half draw them and the other ones are like some assets that I put in there and I try to match them up best I can. Because mm-hmm. if I do everything from scratch, this game will never get made. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say, I, I don't know if there's a stigma around that or not. I don't hang out with enough game developers yet to know. But I think that's really cool that that's a possibility. Like, that's really awesome. And you don't need to, you know, you don't need to start from scratch these days. No, I mean, if you're, if you're doing it as a hobby, that'd be one thing. Um, mm-hmm. because you're not you're not trying to make a living off of it but yeah if you're if you're gonna try and make any money off the games um, and you're, you're working by yourself you have to be like okay let's be realistic about this like um, we're not making Stardew Valley and spending five years on this and hoping that you hit the lottery you know like it's not going to work out like that so yeah or Undertale yeah you know like the, those stories are great and I, I'm really happy for them but like that doesn't happen ever to anybody. Like <laughs> no. thousands of indie games come out and we can name two that have <laughs> right. really exploded like that. Right. I think they all look so good though. Like, Who knows though? Uh, Dunnigan's Trail might be three. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I hope. I, I haven't gotten too much exposure yet. Um, I'm hoping the demo really helps with that, that people can try it out. And um, But it's my first game, so I, d- I have low expectations. Mm-hmm. I think it's such a fun idea. Because, like, we both saw it and we're thinking, oh, it's like Shining Force and Fire Emblem, but it's mm-hmm. also Oregon Trail. Mm-hmm. And it, it's not even based on either of those. Well, it's based on Oregon Trail, but it's not based on either of those other two games. But th- you're going to have the audience of those other two games that are like, oh, what is this? That, and that's awesome because I had, I had no idea. I'm really happy that, like, there's other, other communities that would be interested in it. Yeah, because sometimes too, like if I want to play one of those games, I do just have an hour or an hour and a half, and I don't want to sit down and be like, "Oh, let's start a whole campaign and do all that." <laughs> and like, it, it'd be nice to have an experience in that same kind of genre that is different every time, um, that has mm-hmm. some replayability to it, and then doesn't have a massive time commitment. Yeah, it, I, I was hoping that it would just be one of those things that you can sit down, start game, and if you if you have to read some background on it, you can but you don't need to, and you can just jump right into another run. I'm, I'm curious, too, on character design. Uh, are you going to mostly have, like, human characters? Or are there going to be non-human characters? Like, are we going to get different races? I, right now I have races, um, like your, your classic fantasy races in the code. Um, the problem is I haven't quite un- – I don't know if it's important enough that they're represented graphically. Mm. And that's one thing I've been kind of um, a little bit worried about. You know, I come, I've been, I've been gaming since probably like, I don't know, 1990. So like, I'm not, if there's something like low graphics and I have to use my imagination a little bit Mm -hmm. and read a description to understand, oh yeah, this is an elf or a dwarf or something like that. That doesn't bother me, but um, I'm wondering about the, we'll see what the feedback is like for that kind of thing, what people are expecting from this game and what their experience is. So I would say a tentative, yes, there's going to be like other races that can be played and everything like that. I wouldn't Mm -hmm. want to do all humans, like something like a halfling. I don't think I would be able to represent that very well graphically. So we'll see. We'll see what the feedback's like. Some of the other ones, though, you could just do um, like if it, I don't know how 
quick of a fix this is because I'm obviously not an artist or anything. I can't draw at all. But um, if it's an orc, just color him green. <laughs> yeah. You know, if it's an elf, maybe the elves are from uh, like Firelands. And so they're all a little bit more tan or something. Yeah. <laughs> something like that. That's just uh, so that I can recognize it at a glance, but also it doesn't have to be super different. That could work. Yeah, I'll play around with that. It's 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 a little bit challenging because I only have uh, I only have like a sixteen bit characters on the screen, so like mm-hmm. every pixel counts a lot. That's yeah, for sure. That's why I said too. Like I'm not an artist. Like shading might be really difficult. I'm not much of one either. I'm I'm just learning as I go. <laughs> so what what is the vari- So what is the variation like between playthroughs? So if I play once and then i play the exact same or not the exact same but this the same game like will it be different yeah so uh the big thing i think that's going to be different are um there's a lot of encounters a lot of different encounters that pop up and then also the characters that are with you initially and who you run into on the road uh they don't always have i mean they're going to have generated stats names personalities that kind of thing and so even if you hit the same encounters a few times those have variants in them as well, depending on, um, it could just be like, you know, a random roll on a table that something happens a certain way, or there's a skill check that fails or something along those lines. Yeah. So it's, it's one of those things kind of like death road, like we've mentioned before, death road, the Canada plays a lot like that. Um, mm-hmm. or even like hand of fate, you know, you get to know those, those card decks pretty well, but it still plays out like a story. Uh, I'm kind of curious though too like are you always going to end sort of in the same place like would the final boss be sort of the same or um, like how how much variance can there be and I understand that uh, with a dev team of about one (laughs) you've got to definitely limit scope but I'm interested in that. I think I think the end game will probably largely be the same where it gets to be more difficult fights and you know, some bosses and things like that. The order in which you get there, though, for the demo, I'm going to have three different biomes. So, like, maybe four. Maybe like grasslands, uh, forest, desert, and, like, a um, like a cemetery, like, spooky kind of Castlevania thing. Oh, fun. And and so those aren't, those aren't going to pop up in the same order. Like, you would always start out, like, in the grassland, probably. You know, like, that's your starting, mm-hmm. you know, Where you're coming area. from. Right. But then you might hit the desert next. Um, you might hit the... The cemetery next if it if it works out you know maybe down the line i might be able to make it so people can make decisions on where they want to go next and maybe there might be some scouting information like those are all nice to have kind of things i don't know if i'm going to have time to get into that kind of stuff but i'd like to do that at some point get the player a little more control yeah i saw that you have a little bit of that in with um on your steam page it had or yeah i think it was on the trailer it has that you uh come across a cauldron and oh, you yeah. can throw choose to throw different things in yep that's one of those uh yeah that's one of those those encounters that you will pop up and depending on what you choose that won't necessarily dictate where you go next but it will dictate um you know there might someone might get a, a stat increase or the party might take a bunch of damage if you pick the wrong thing and so that and that kind of thing might only pop up like once every three or four playthroughs and so it's not going to be so repetitive that, like, you know, after a while you play the game or you look at a wiki or something like that, you're going to know mm-hmm. what does what. But, again, if I add skill checks, some random tables and things like that, it might not be the same. Uh, that, that sounds great. And I see, too, that um, you don't have an ox pulling the cart. What What is that? Is that <laughs> that's, an ogre? That's an, that's an orc. That's <laughs> okay. <laughs> that I is love one of that. My D, that's one of my D&D characters uh, from a one-shot that I played um, – named derpus and he, it was basically just based off no actually my friend played derpus i played in a, uh, a gnome called slow drizzle and we were bas- basically a couple of uh moonshiners is based off that show like squid billies so like i had convinced even though i was a gnome i convinced him that i was his father and it was it was a whole funny thing but yeah, i brought him into this game to pull the wagon and there's not a lot in terms of like you don't have to worry about your wagon breaking down not having a part or anything like that but you do have to worry about his morale and his energy so if Derpus gets sad, he'll stop the cart and you lose a day and you have to, you have to eat and you have to, you know, heal and everything like that. Um, and, you know, the stupidest things could upset him. So uh, that's one of those things. But he doesn't die. Derpus never dies. He only gets sad or, or gets tired. Good to know. <laughs> I feel obligated to ask this as Oregon Trail has been an influence on this game. Is it possible for characters to die from dysentery? 
Possibly. Possibly. All right. But it, 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 it is very possible that that could happen. <laughs> heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> My question very similarly was, uh, I, I never know. Should I fjord the river or do I wait? <laughs> <laughs> I say, I say just float, you know, just, I always go for it. Tips over with, you know, big deal. <laughs> As long story. as I know we can't lose Derpus, I'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe to the end of the line. <laughs> is Steam the best place for people to check out your game? Yeah. Uh, it's the Steam page, and um, I do have a website, bananahammergames.com. There's a newsletter you can sign up for there if you want to keep more up to date. And um, yeah, those are basically the best two places that have my Twitter. Awesome. And then what is the best way for players, people, our listeners to support you? Honestly, I'd just be happy if. Uh, people played the game and like even if they didn't enjoy it it's still cool that someone got to experience it and just they, stick uh, around. they can wish list you on steam as well it's that's that's a big thing yeah i, I could really use the wish list <laughs> <laughs> so that'd be the number one way to to support me for sure awesome so we'll have all of that in the comments so you can check that out uh brian thank you so much for joining us any last minute stuff to get off your chest before we we wrap up um no no, just thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, no problem. It's, it's been a blast. want to hear more about this, and I want to hear more about the pizza thing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you so much for listening to our interview. If you like what you're hearing, please go give us a nice five-star rating and a subscription on Apple Podcasts. We want to keep the conversation going, so please reach out to us on Twitter at the Turn by Turn Pod or on Instagram at the Turn by Turn Podcast. We are available wherever podcasts are sold. Thank you so much, and we'll talk to you next week. Bye. Bye.